Hi Fabio. Hi Gino, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. How's it going? Pretty good. Great, great. So uh, today I'm joined by Fabio Pereira. So thank you very much for, for joining us today. Fabio is an author and he's going to be talking to us about his book, Digital Nudge, and just talking through some of the ideas behind the book and some of the ways that it can apply to our lives and to email. Um, so to get started, like, could you just tell me a little bit about yourself, maybe a little bit about your background? Yeah, so I'm um, originally Brazilian, a uh, bit of Australian in me as well. I've lived in Australia for eight years and then came back to Brazil. And I'm a technologist, so I've, I've been working with technology for about like 21, 22 years now. And because I've been working on the side of people who create technology, I've actually seen what's behind the scenes, right? So because I saw people influencing each other through technology, I was like, wow, maybe I should tell the world all the secrets behind how we get persuaded and influenced to click, to like, to send something, to read something. And pretty much that's my background. I'm a technologist who decided to, to spread to the world some of the secrets behind what we do when we are building our digital products. Cool. Yeah, and like there's definitely a lot of secrets and a lot of hidden forces I feel like behind the way that products are designed and even before digital technology there was a lot of things, you know, that were put into writing advertisements and stuff like that to to influence people and I feel like understanding that is something that everyone should should do. Um great. So, so, uh, so to, moving on to your book then, so Digital Nudge, uh, I read your book, it was super interesting how it kind of breaks down how we think we're very rational and we actually aren't as rational as we think and we can be quite easily influenced and you know, not to sound elitist because everyone actually is <laughs> quite irrational without realizing it. Um, and so when I read your book, uh, I there was two other books I read before, which uh, I feel were, were very, very related and which I recommend anyone listening to read too. Uh, the first one is Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. And the other one, Dan O'Reilly, uh, Predictably Irrational. So uh, it, it, they both kind of touch on, um, on behavioral economics and how our influences are... Uh, sorry, our decisions are influenced by, by forces that we might not be aware of. Um, so, digital nudge. You describe a nudge as any aspect of the choice architecture that alters people's behavior in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing their economic incentives. So, could you just like run me through uh, an example of a digital nudge maybe to help our listeners understand what, what they are exactly? Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned Dan Ariely and Daniel Kahneman, which are like top two of the behavioral scientists, and also Thaler and Sunstein, who wrote the book Nudge. So those three books are really the three books that inspired me, Predictably Rational, Thinking Fast and Slow, and Nudge. In fact, there is a chapter in the book called Clicking Fast and Slow, which is about exactly the hidden forces that make us click. So behavior economics is a big deal for me and uh, in fact the, the book it's a combination of the behavior economics and the digital world. And the, some of the easiest ways I have to explain what a digital nudge is, is to give an example. So one example could be uh, if you're watching let's say Netflix and you're watching a TV show and you on the episode one and episode one finishes and automatically it plays episode two. So that is a digital nudge because it was a way to make it easy for you to make a decision of keeping watching the show without forbidding you to stop watching. You can stop watching anytime you want, but if you don't click stop, it, it's easier for you to keep watching. So in terms of if, I've, if I'm a Netflix like user experience person and I want to increase your time watching the TV shows which most of the times is some of the metrics is like the time you spend uh, watching things. Having this functionality called autoplay, it's one way, it's autoplay is one of the most efficient digital nudges because behavior science shows that if you want someone to do something, make them, make them do that something by doing nothing. 
So by doing nothing, I keep watching. And another very, very common nudge I talk about as well when people ask me, like, give me a simple example is, if you search something on Google, you usually have like millions of results and like hundreds of pages to navigate and see the results. But 9 in 10 people, like 91.5% of people click on a result on the first page. So pretty much putting a result on the first page, it's a digital nudge from Google to influence you to click on that result. And there's many others uh, we can talk about as well. There's websites who do things like they touch a very deep part of us which is called loss aversion. Let's say you're trying to find a place to stay somewhere and you're looking for a hotel and then suddenly you see a message going like this is the last room available in this hotel and you go like oh my god I have to book it now otherwise I'm gonna lose it. So the loss aversion is another aspect of behavior economics as well. It's another bias that gets used to influence you to do something. Yeah, so loss aversion. So I myself actually, I used to work in a call center for a hotel chain. And we were always taught, you know, to make it sound like that room was the last one left. There was some little tricks that we would do in the way that we would tell people that, oh, yeah, I have a room left. Probably the hotel was full of rooms, you know, but I would tell them, oh, yeah, I have a room for you at this price. And yeah, it was, uh, it would really skyrocket the number of people who booked, you know, it, it, it's a very powerful thing to kind of influence people to do something. Um, so, uh, you, you go over kind of like how we're full of biases and like when we use digital devices, uh, like in the real world, we don't really like put a lot of form into what we're doing. You know, we kind of scroll kind of mindlessly or can sometimes make decisions a bit mindlessly, like the, the number one brain and the two brain like Daniel Kahneman talks about, right? We tend to operate on the one brain because it's exhausting to operate on the two brain. Um, so you state that the whole point of your book is to raise your digital consciousness about digital nudges and the hidden forces that influence your digital decisions. And you give five steps to doing this. So number one, accept that you're digitally irrational. Number two, observe your digital behavior. Number three, try making small changes. Number four, talk to other people and learn together. And number five, go back to step two and do it all over again. So would you be able to give us maybe some examples of how you yourself followed those steps that you came up with? Yeah, sure. The number one step is the one that I guess it doesn't repeat because once you accept that we are irrational, it's, very, it's a deep, it's a simple but deep thing that happens within us. I still remember when I was reading Predictably Irrational from Dan and... And like the name of the book is predictably irrational. And I'm like, I, I grew up hearing that humans are rational. Like, I don't know if you studied that, but I've studied that in school. I was like, what's the difference between humans and other animals? And people are like, because humans are rational. So to me, it was very hard to accept. And that's why the verb is accepting that we are irrational, that we can and we are manipulated all the time because... I try to fight that feeling of acceptance that I am irrational. And I try to think, and I guess that if you're hearing this and watching this and you're thinking like, I'm rational, I don't get influenced by anyone. Like, I make my own decisions. And that's, that's not true. That is not true. And when we accept that, like when I've accepted that, my life changed because then I started to see things in a way which were, instead of deceiving myself in thinking that I am rational, I was like, okay, I am irrational and I am being manipulated and influenced all the time. I just need to understand how. And then I've moved to the next step, which is exactly like understanding how these things happen. And the, the second step is about self-observation, right? It's about watching yourself. What are your habits? What do you do? And then even on the book, I have a step-by-step -step to explain, like, what are the, the sorts of questions that you can do to yourself that we can talk a little bit further uh, on, on self-observation and self-awareness, which is, like, if you look on, like, an application that shows your screen time on your phone, I've, I've had a lot of people where I was like, can you open this app? How much time do you think you spend on social media every day? And people go, like, about an hour or two. 
And when they open the phone, it tells them like they spend four, five, six hours a day on that. So that shows that reality and our perception of our reality is not the same. That's why observing our behavior when we are living in the digital world is very, very important. So by observing, then we can change. We cannot, we cannot change something that we are not aware of. That's the first thing. So it's self-observation. And then I don't believe in big changes. Like I don't think we can go and change completely something. That's why I suggest small changes. I'm more of a person, I come from an agile background, like agile methodologies and continuous improvement. And like there is a book called Atomic Habits that shows that if you improve like 1% at a time, then you can exponentially grow your improvements. So it's, it's about making those tiny little improvements, but keeping doing them. So if every week we make one change in a positive direction in our lives, like for example, observing something that you do that you want to change. And my advice is that this is very personal. I can't tell you or anyone that they should spend less time on screen, for example, because it depends on what they're doing on the screen. But so the advice is, is generic to the extent which is about them self-observing and then making small changes. And the talking to other people is to share knowledge because if I just do it for myself, I might not even think about um, what changes I should be doing. So I'm a true believer of communities as well. Uh, here in Brazil, we have a community of behavioral scientists that started with about 10 people and now there's a, over a thousand people in the community and it's a meetup group and we get together and we share knowledge and we, we learn from each other. So I'm a true believer of the power of the communities as well. And so that's, that's also like to, to learn from each other. And that's why I say go back to step two, because we observe, we change, we make a small change, and we learn from each other, and then that's a continuous loop. Like, we'll never end. I believe I'll be doing that for the rest of my life. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, for me as well, when, you know, realizing how you're kind of being influenced, it seems like... You have to accept that you're being irrational to become more rational. You know, it's the only way to actually be rational is to understand the ways in which you are rational. Um, and same with like, I would always try to make big changes and reduce my horrific five hour a day Instagram screen time. And by, you know, uninstalling Instagram and it was back on my phone in three days, you know, but now I've whittled it down to like two hours a day or something by just making small adjustments and stuff instead of going for full whack trying to make big unrealistic changes so yeah definitely this advice kind of resonated with me on a personal level and yeah it's it's interesting um so uh i understand that like you know a lot of these uh you mentioned in your book a lot of cognitive biases and the like, these steps also kind of based on you know observing cognitive biases and the way that we kind of are influenced by them I've seen a huge list of cognitive biases. There's hundreds, right? Someone's categorized them as a genetic list. How did you go about kind of studying them? Did you memorize them? It's kind of overwhelming to think like, wow, there's all of these things influencing me all the time. And like, how do I become as rational as possible? Do, do you have a way of studying them specifically? Well, I'm going to say it's probably humanly impossible to know all of them because there's over 180 mapped. It was 160 and then now it's over 180. So it's, I think, like no one can, can be, like, rem remember all of them. But what I usually do is when I have a feeling that there is a bias being used to influence me, then I look for it. So to go back to the example of booking a hotel and seeing something going like, this is the last room, I go like, there must be something that I've been influenced to, to think about that way of there is a, this is the last hotel. So I sometimes go to the, the, the list of cognitive biases. There's a bunch of websites. I go to like the Wikipedia list of all of them, which is very simple. Sometimes there's like images that I can connect. And I go like, okay, so it's trying to touch deep inside of my loss aversion bias. The one we were talking about, the autoplay, there is a bias, which is the status quo bias. So the status quo bias is the tendency for us to remain wherever we are as long as we, don't, uh, we are not in pain because if we are in pain then we want to relieve the pain. But if we are in a state of like watching a, an episode of a TV show 
we're not in pain, we're in bed, we're on the sofa. The status quo bias is the one that touches us. So I was like, okay, status quo bias, loss aversion. And then I will never be able to list all of the 180, but sometimes when I see that there is an element of influence, then I go and I look for which bias can be used. And what I try to do on the book as well is to map and this can actually help people from like UX, user, user experience, and product creators. Because if they want to influence someone to do something, and if that something is good, like let's say you want to influence someone who has diabetes, to not have to think about their diabetes, and if they need to do something about it, like take insulin for example, then they get a, a notification, then they get a nudge. That's a nudge for good, so I, I always like try to map which biases can be used to generate digital nudges for good. And that's kind of how I studied. I created like a map uh, of which ones can be used to influence which behavior. But I will, I think I, I can't even name like a hundred of the 180. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's definitely way too many. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like, yeah, I guess like as you go noticing them, you're going to start remembering them, you know? And, like, there's not really any need to memorize all of them as long as you, you know, understand them. Um, cool, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting, actually, you mentioned the, the diabetes tracker. So my, my uncle has diabetes, and, like, he always had to be checking his blood sugar and stuff, and, like, it was a, a whole hassle, you know? He's, like, he's 50-odd years old, so he's like, quite old. He's had his whole life. And now he just wears a little patch, and it's just an app on his phone, and just vibrates and tells him when he's, like, low or high blood sugar, and he can take his like, insulin. So, like, there's a lot of good that can be done for sure. And then a lot of, like, kind of bad, the bad side of it, which would be dark pattern, right? Which is the influencing people to do something because you just want to take advantage of them and make them buy stuff. So I feel like understanding biases in that sense can help you avoid all of those as well. Um, so, uh, moving on to, to email meter itself. Uh, so... For the, the steps that you kind of outlined before about, you know, understanding how you're rational and, and making small changes, how do you feel that a service like, like email meter, which, you know, kind of shows you your email behavior, how do you feel that it could, it could help you with those things? Good. So email, email is such a place where we spend so much of our lives as well, like social media, email streaming like it is a place where we've been living a lot so on the email side I have an analogy which is information is like food so we receive information from different channels right we get information from audio from like text uh, and we consume that information so I want to use that analogy from now on which is can you imagine if information was like food how are you consuming your information Who's giving you your diet? And email is something that we receive email on a timeline, right? So emails arrive to our inbox as a timeline. And the first, the first thing I recommend is do not consume your email on the same sequence that you receive your email because you're giving the power to your consumption to the senders. So if you receive an email now and if you just received an email one hour ago, like what should be telling which one of those two emails is the most important to you should be you. And then how should we be doing that? By creating filters, by creating like labels, by prioritizing our inbox in a way that shows us our emails from the most important and urgent ones to the least important and urgent ones. So what email meter gives me is it gives me a way to analyze my email consumption and my email production as well because we are both information consumers and producers like all the time we're doing that and I quite like the, the when, when email meter shows me the top interactions which is people I interact the most then I go like it, it feels like last month I've interacted a lot with this person so I'm gonna add them to the top of my list so when they send me an email I'll see it first so we can, we can use those metrics and those details to help us prioritize email consumption. That's the, the main thing I use email meter for. I like to see things like my response time as well because I like to keep... Uh, uh, what I do with people is I set an expectation. I say, if you need something from me urgently, 
it should be a chat message it shouldn't be email like email should have at least a 24 hour response time expectation if you need something in less than 24 hours do not send an email and expect that I'm gonna be responding so that response time that email meter shows is very good and, and my favorite one is emails that I don't even read so <laughs> I, I, I usually say that if you wanna save your attention just create a lot of filters that will skip emails from your inbox without you even having to read them it's like if you went to an all-you-can-eat place could be because I'm Brazilian but have you ever been to an all-you-can-eat place Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> so you go to an all-you-can-eat place, and can you imagine you eating all that food? Like, it's physically impossible to shove it all in your mouth and eat everything <laughs> because it's, it's like physically it doesn't fit. So that's sometimes what we try to do with information. We try to just shove a bunch of information inside of us through our brains, and what happens is if you receive 100 emails a day or 1,000 emails a day, I see a lot of people missing important emails because they receive a hundred emails a day and then they consume the first 50 and the last 50 doesn't fit because it's too much but the email like 67 was the most important email that they should have read on that day and then they miss it and then they go to a meeting and they go like what what are you talking about I haven't seen that because they've decided to consume email on the sequence that it arrived and not through a an intentional prioritization method. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 I feel like uh, it's something that we often hear from our users. You know how they have too many emails and are overwhelmed. And yeah, I can see totally how it's important to be picky and to kind of choose the the only what you really need to see because otherwise you're going to be overwhelmed. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I've myself like to give my my experience of it is like setting up filters to to kind of get rid of stuff and you know obviously spam and stuff like that but then trying to prioritize things and i guess always i have a little bit of like a fear that i'm going to miss something when i'm setting up these filters <laughs> you know <laughs> just like i don't want to i don't want to miss out <laughs> yeah there is you see loss of urgen like exactly uh, actually, yeah, yeah. there is one uh, acronym called fomo have you heard of fomo yeah of course fear of missing out right <laughs> yeah, so if you're hearing this and you have never heard of FOMO, FOMO is the fear of missing out. So the fear of missing out comes from the fact that you don't know what you're missing. So if your 100 emails arrive and you don't intentionally know what you're missing, then you go like, what if I miss something? But if you intentionally filter, let's say you go to an all-you-can-eat place and you're a vegetarian. You know that every time someone comes offering you meat, you will not have it. So you've intentionally created a way to decide what you want to say yes to and what you want to say no to. So you're not going to have fear of missing out on the meat because you've deliberately, intentionally made that decision that you want to say no to meat. And the problem is by not intentionally saying no to something, you end up eating a bunch of other things and then you're like, oh my God, I'm going to miss out on something. So I, I have JOMO. Know what JOMO means? It's the joy of missing out. Like it's right now I'm here with you and I'm missing out on a bunch of other things because my attention is fully here. So there's a bunch of other things happening in my life, in my digital life, like on my email, on my chat, inboxes, and I am joyfully like missing out on all of them because I've made that decision. Yeah, same, same completely. I can hear my phone vibrating and I have nine Slack notifications, but you know, of course, like it's, you can't always be everywhere all the time and there's way more important things. Um, cool. So, um, hmm, um, so how do you, what role do you think that like kind of digital nudges play in the way that we actually like compose emails or the way we use our email inboxes? Like, for example, when, when you type on, on Gmail, uh, they have a feature where it fills in what you're about to say. It kind of, so if I say I look, it will say fill out to forward to speaking with you. So do you feel, is that a form of digital knowledge? Are they trying to influence this in some way there? Yeah, and that's a very good one. I quite like the autocomplete on any device like email or any, any place where you're building a message, then there might be autocomplete. And if, if the autocomplete is clever enough, 
it almost feels like you it can read your mind. Like I, that's exactly yeah. what I wanted to say. So autocomplete, the same way that autoplay on like keep playing things without you having to say next, next, next is one nudge to keep watching. The autoplay is also a nudge. I mean, the autocomplete is also also a nudge to help you uh, formulate like a, a sentence because. At the end of the day, it's all about how much attention you're spending. So the, to go back to the diabetes example, like if someone, I had a friend, Greg, who worked with me and he had diabetes and he was like, sometimes I'm in a meeting and then I feel like, should I observe how I'm feeling? And then he was totally like focused on his feelings and he was no longer paying attention to the meeting. So when he put like a continuous device to monitor his glucose levels then he was like now I can have my full attention here and then I can be like sure that if I need to do something I'll be notified so at the end of the day it's all about your attention it's all about whether your attention is being sucked or if it's being filled if you're gaining attention or if you're losing attention it's like as if our attention was a battery and then when you're doing something, think about is that draining my battery or is that filling up my battery? So in terms of the autocomplete, it is filling up my battery because it's saving effort. Like I don't have to think about that whole sentence because the digital device has thought through, through artificial intelligence and, and data, and then it's given me a suggestion. And I'm like, that's exactly what I wanted to do. In fact, uh, uh, there's even like uh, places where you can go and it can write a whole text for you. Like you can say, just write an essay on something and it, and it does. So yeah, so definitely digital nudges for text creation. Yeah. Wow. That's, I haven't thought of like that before. That's super interesting. Like I think I saw in your book how you say how, you know, attention is a finite resource. So like it really is something that you need to cherish and like hold on to and where you can use these things to... To help you save them and yeah the ai to generate copy is something i've used myself and it's super useful so not to write everything but to, to get things started it's it's great okay cool and so like uh is there anything else to, like that you use email me to for maybe to to help you with yeah so one thing that i use it for as well is remember remember the analogy i had with food like if information was food and if every single email i have it's like a snack i would get to get on a scale and check my weight right so i still remember like when i went to a nutritionist for the first time even before like asking me anything she just said get on the scale and then it was like a scale that gave not just the weight, but it gave like other, other metrics as well about my body and like how, how, how much fat I have and how much muscle I have. And I was like, it's so important to know where I sit and get on the scale. And I guess the email meter gives me that. It is my email scale where I can get on it and I look at it month by month and I see trends. So going back to the nutritionist as well, if I want to gain weight, so let's say I wanted to gain muscle, not always we want to lose weight, but what if I wanted to gain muscle, which is some of the things I try to do, then I would measure my percentage of muscle on my body, and then a month later I would go and say, how much is the percentage? I've increased like 1%. And then it means I'm getting on the scale, and email meter for me is like that email scale. Cool. Yeah. So um, we have a saying here, which is you can't improve what you can't measure. So that's definitely something that we try to encourage people to do is to, you know, always, even if you're not even so specifically using the numbers for anything, to just be aware of how many emails you're getting. Because then you can see if there's a huge spike or if there's a huge drop or if there's anything that, you know, you should be aware of. Cool. So um, if, for myself, as one of the people who, who develops email meter i'm quite interested in what you have to say like in what kind of advice you might have for me as we develop email meter how we can help to raise people's digital consciousness yeah it's it's good you ask because i've been thinking about some things that i wish i had on email meter that i don't so if i had like a wish list a few things that i would try and show is exactly the ratio 
between what I really consume and what I don't consume. So let's say I receive a thousand emails a month. I'd like to know how many of those emails have been automatically filtered out of my inbox. So I also use a method called Inbox Zero, which is from Merlin Mann. He's, uh, he's created that method and I, I use it with an adapted version of it. But one of the things on Inbox Zero is about archiving emails that don't matter. So I would say that the ratio of emails that got archived, I don't know if that data is available, but because I can also archive an email by myself, so if I manually archive compared to an automatically archived email, those those metrics are something that I don't visualize now on on email meter, which is I wanted to know out of those like 1000 emails that I've received, how many of them were emails that got automatically archived, which are pretty much the things that I've saved. So I, I love analogies. So I'm going to use the analogy of the, the all you can eat place again. Let's say I'm vegetarian. I go to an all you can eat place and I have two approaches. One approach is to wait for every time the waiter comes with meat and I say no. And then the waiter comes every five minutes with meat and I go like, no, thank you, no, thank you, no, thank you, no, thank you. Or I create an automatic filter that I can go to the waiter and say, please do not even offer me meat. So when you come to my table, skip my table. So skipping my table is like skipping inbox. And that skipping inbox, the automatically skipped emails are fully saved because it has spent zero of my attention. And that's one of the metrics I would like to see, which is like how much time things like by not reading 50% of your emails, you've, you've saved like five hours of your month or something like that. Or you've saved the time saved, like my, my time and attention savings is something that if you showed people that, that could even be a metric. They could say next month I want to save more. Because I want to spend that time, like those eight hours that I've saved, I want to spend it with my family. Like those are eight more hours with my family or exercising or doing whatever, like drinking coconut water on the beach or whatever you feel like should be your, or focusing on other projects which are like your priority. So I would say there is a movement called time well spent. And... It was started by Tristan Harris and and that, that time well spent is something that I really look for. So if I want to spend my time well, I need to know where I'm spending my time. And I guess some of those metrics are not too clear on email meter. I would prioritize some of those things. And yeah, and even some of the things I would I'd probably the, I'd probably say that if you could personalize the dashboard I would say to me, like those three are the top three metrics I would care and I don't care about the other one. So dashboard personalization could be one thing as well because then we focus our attention on the metrics that really matter instead of seeing like 50 metrics and I, don't, I only care about five. So that's something else I would suggest as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, yeah, it definitely, and it's it's super interesting. Like, so right now we have, uh, there's a filter where you could filter your report to show you how many emails you have archived and how many you don't. But to, you know, tie that in with the, f which is automatically filtered and the, the, the rules that you have set up is, is a really interesting concept. And especially the turning it into an, a, like a, an insight, a digestible insight that tells you that you've saved this much time. It's like something that we're really exploring already, which is to, to make things as kind of, you know, like to take, turn numbers into something that you can use and you can understand immediately, you know, and so that, that's a great idea for sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, cool. So, um, and then, so like digital nudges, when it comes to you kind of receiving emails, have you noticed any in an email before that like, you know, like a marketing email or an email from, from a friend or someone where you've noticed that digital nudge being kind of used? on you or are you using it on someone else all the time pretty much <laughs> <laughs> yeah so when people are trying to influence me through like the headlines of the email um, but I've seen bad ones and good ones as well maybe I should mention good ones uh, if you send an email to someone and there is a 
TLDR, which is a too long didn't read. I call it like if you could express your whole email in one tweet. How would you like phrase that? Sometimes I, I, I don't write TLDR, I write email tweet. So I quite <laughs> like when people send me an email that has like a four paragraphs, but the first statement is almost enough for me to digest that message and understand whether I have or not to read the, the rest of the email. I'd say a bad version of that is when people, and that's a nudge, right? A nudge in order to save your attention and to allow you to focus on what really matters. And if you read the beginning of the email and you feel like that's not for you or there's no action to you, uh, then you don't even read the rest. Action uh, is something else which is quite important. Emails that make it very clear what they expect from you as a, as a call to action and a next step, especially in a corporate environment, right? Uh, it's very important that the emails make it clear what is expected from you as opposed to just more information to feed you with more food. It's like, this is an email, this is the information, and here's what we expect for you. So good nudges are things that make call to actions, like the famous CTAs on marketing, very clear and that you can understand whether that call to action will benefit you or not. I would say those are a few of the things. Yeah, action, focusing on actions and reducing the messages. We now live in the world of overload of information. And if someone writes an email with half the content and they express the message, I would say a big deal in humans right now is the, the ability to summarize a message as opposed to writing like 78 pages of a document and sending it through and going like, this is our new process and no one reads it. And wh why do people spend time producing a lot of content and information that doesn't get consumed? It's like a restaurant cooking food that no one eats. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, definitely. That's I've so like TLDR is something that I've seen before. I think on like on Reddit posts, but I've never actually seen it uh, in an email and like or an email tweet. That's a it's a really interesting concept, and yeah, it's like something that we we've read about before. And that myself as a as a copywriter, it's like a huge part of my job is taking big long things of text that other team members might write and trying to whittle it down into something that like people can even decide if they want to consume or not immediately because they know what it's going to be from the first sentence or if they do choose to consume it, it doesn't take up too much of their time because it's not too long you know it's it's down to the important parts cool so yeah um okay and so moving on to to kind of like uh away from you when we turn more towards kind of productivity and and maybe like distractions so like i mentioned um earlier on that i have a bit of, a, of an instagram habit um, so you talk about limiting your screen time and like kind of knowing when you need to be offline. Um, could you talk us through maybe some of the, the steps you took to kind of to, to reduce your screen time, which you do mention in your book, I believe, right? That you had like you looked at your screen time and you tried actively to, to reduce it. If you could maybe run us through some of the steps that you took to, to try and make that happen. Yeah, to be honest, in the last two years of the, the pandemic world that we are living in, I've actually increased my screen time, but I've increased it with things that I really need to and I want to. So I usually say it's not about the time you spend, it's about what you're doing on that time. Because my partner, for example, she works with social media. So if she checks her social media screen time, it's going to be very high. <laughs> yeah. like if I Let's say... You spend your time recording podcasts and you record like five podcasts a day and your screen time recording podcast is really high. So it's not about just the screen time. That's what I mean. It's about watching what you do. So one thing I've done was I've categorized my screen time and it's not about just reducing, reducing it overall, but it's about doing less of the things that I want to do less and doing more of the things I want to do more. And so for example, for me, one of the things that I wanted to do less was social media. But social media just for the, the sake of scrolling. Like I didn't want to open and scroll and scroll just for the sake of scrolling. So one of the things I've done, I want to give that tip, which is something good, is I use a tool called Pocket. It's called Get Pocket. And when I see something I want to read or listen to, 
uh, I save it in my pocket. And when I when I'm like on my free time and I want to like scroll on something, I usually go to something that I've intentionally said my present self told my future self that that should be something you should be consuming. Then I read it or I watch it. Also, like on YouTube, sometimes I see a video. Let's say I see a 15-minute video I want to watch and I don't want to watch it now because it's not the right time to spend those 15 minutes on. Then I save it on a on a playlist that I, that's called Watch Later. Uh, and that Watch Later also gives me the ability to have the time when I'm going to be watching videos or when I'm going to be scrolling on something but more intentionally. So I would say the big changes on intentionality is being intentional and being more active and having the power of do what you said to yourself you should be doing as opposed to being passive. Timelines is just a horrible thing because you go to a timeline and you've automatically given the power of the sequence of that content to someone else, to the algorithm that will prioritize things for you. Recently, I was quite happy that Instagram created, it, it's given us the power to control our timelines. It's something very recent. It's been like a couple of months or even less that we can create our own timeline. So we've regained the power to consume the information we, we want to consume. Uh, so those are some of the things that I've done. The other main thing is zero notifications. Like I have literally zero notifications on my phone, on my computer, like everywhere. I, I, I am against like notifications. The other day my sister was here and her phone was like ding, ding, ding. And I was like, what do you have dinging on your phone? And she was like, it's my WhatsApp. So I was like, do you read it like every time it dings? And she was like, no, but it keeps dinging. So I was like, let's let me teach you how to disable the dings. <laughs> <laughs> so the zero notification is one thing. When I go to bed, I either leave my phone outside of the room or I put it on the like the airplane mode. So the airplane mode is the one where, OK, it's my alarm sound will will sound to wake me up, but I will have zero like interaction with anything and the airplane mode is a is a practice that I've also done yeah many many ones many many ones I guess th there's another one about calendar organization like my I, I use Google Calendar for everything like I have on my Google Calendar the time I'm gonna have lunch the time I'm gonna exercise all the meetings I'll have and I have it all on my calendar that's a practice as well that helps with productivity and distraction. And if I'm on one thing, I'm just on one thing. So context switching is something I fully avoid as well. Like trying to do two things at the same time, it's, yeah. it's another practice I, I do as well. Yeah, cool. Well, so like for me, the, the biggest fear I had when disabling notifications, which was a big step as well that I tried to take was, you know, for work, if you work, what if you get a notification from work? That was kind of my biggest fear. And uh, also, like, to make plans with friends and stuff, I always felt like I was missing out, like, something. Um, and then I accidentally... Uh, Apple introduced a feature where it would group your notifications and give you them at a certain time of the day. I don't know if you saw that. It was quite recent. And I, I enabled that, but then disabled it because I didn't really want to use it. And I didn't realize it turned all my notifications off. And I only realized a few days later, and I was like, well, like... I. I have not been looking at my phone as much and I, you know, since then I've kind of turned off most of them as well. Not all of them yet. I'm still working towards that, but I can see how it really is a, a huge help to kind of avoid like scrolling mindlessly and, you know, trying to be intentional. Uh, yeah, for me, another thing was turning uh, Instagram time into Duolingo time, which is kind of, you know, productive, productive scrolling or productive use of like your screen time. Um, well, cool. Yeah. It's interesting to hear like your, your perspective on it. Um, great. So uh, I think uh, we'll start wrapping up now. Um, so before we go, uh, just want to think, Marinella mentioned you have a, an interesting tattoo on your arm. Would, would you want to show it to us? Oh, the tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the tattoo is the actually the, the, the cover of the book, which is this robotic hand nudging a phone. So in terms of the tattoo, it's uh, it's the hand 
And here I have a circle of uh, some elements that represent my life. So I have a kangaroo, which is to represent my Australian citizenship. I have a Buddha here that represents my passion for Buddhism. There is a kettlebell. I'm a crossfitter. So yeah, so I have a few elements that represent uh, elements of my life, and I call it a uh, life nudge, which is <laughs> a, there was like a, an, in, an invisible force, which is this hand. And I, I truly believe that there is an invisible force as well that kind of nudges us towards some places in our lives. And to me, that's my definition of what God is, which is like this, this invisible um, energy that helps us go towards good places in our lives. And that's kind of what I mean by the, the life nudge. Yeah, wow. Okay, cool. <laughs> Great. Well, um, yeah, thanks so much for joining us, Fabio. It's been super interesting to talk to you. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you'll be, we'll be hearing from you again soon. And um, yeah, and everyone else, thank you for, for joining us and, uh, and stay tuned. Uh, we'll be doing some, some more podcasts and some more conversations soon, I hope. Thanks, Gino, and thanks everyone for watching. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.